My name is Dr. Kevin Weich. Welcome to this lecture series on air quality management, during which we're going to learn about our atmosphere and the issues we have with air pollution. Let's start right at the beginning. What do we mean by the term atmosphere? Well, the word atmosphere is derived from the Greek atmos, meaning vapour, and sphera, meaning ball, and it refers to the gaseous envelope that surrounds a planet. Our atmosphere is a complex multi-phase system comprised of many different species of gases and particles. Although it is in fact just one of five components of the overall Earth system. The Earth system is composed of five core interlinking elements. These are the lands, which we refer to as the lithosphere, life, or the biosphere, waters and ice, or the hydrosphere and cryosphere, the air, the atmosphere, and finally, the Earth-space interface, the point where the outer reaches of the atmosphere interact with the vacuum of space. Within this lecture series, we will investigate many aspects of the atmosphere, the fragile, thin blue line that encompasses our world and supports life on this planet as we know it. The Earth's atmosphere has a distinct layered structure, divided into regions by virtue of its temperature profile. Starting at the Earth's surface, the first region of the atmosphere is the troposphere, the region in which we live. The troposphere is that part of the atmosphere that interacts with the Earth's surface and into which the vast majority of natural and man-made emissions occur. Bounded by the tropopause, which puts a cap on the region, the troposphere is the densest part of the atmosphere. It is turbulent and characterised by a gradually decreasing temperature profile with altitude, and is the region we will focus our attention during these lectures. Above the troposphere, we find the stratosphere, which is characterised by an increasing temperature profile with altitude. This increase in temperature comes as a result of the ozone layer, a thick band of ozone gas between roughly 15 and 30 kilometres up, which absorbs the sun's ultraviolet radiation, ultimately emitting heat and in turn protecting life at the surface. Above the stratosphere, we find the upper atmosphere, the mesosphere, thermosphere and exosphere where dramatic phenomena such as the aurora and upper atmospheric lightning play out. Interestingly, 99% of the mass of the atmosphere exists below the middle of the stratosphere, with atmospheric pressure decreasing in a rapid, non-linear manner with altitude. Although compositionally very diverse, the atmosphere is primarily composed of the inert gas nitrogen and the more reactive gas oxygen. Together, these two gases make up approximately 99% of the atmosphere. So what about that remaining 1%? Now this is where things get interesting. This tiny remaining fraction of the atmosphere comprises the trace gases. And it is these species that drive the chemistry of our atmosphere. Constituents of this 1% include water vapour, carbon dioxide, methane, carbon monoxide, ozone, sulphur dioxide and many more. As you can see, each of these gases make up only a tiny fraction of the air, with the notable exception of water vapour, the abundance of which can vary significantly depending on where in the atmosphere you are. In atmospheric science, we often refer to these quantities not as percentages, as you see here, but as a mixing ratio. That is, so many parts of one thing amongst so many parts of another. For instance, 0.00035% carbon dioxide is roughly 340 parts per million by volume, or PPMV for short. That is, there are 340 carbon dioxide molecules within a volume 
comprised of one million other molecules. Here, PPHV refers to parts per 100, PPBV to parts per billion, and PPTV to parts per trillion, a very small quantity. In the absence of anthropogenic emissions, the chemistry of the natural troposphere can be generally considered as a cyclic process, involving tiny quantities of reactive trace gases within that remaining 1%. This figure is a generalisation of the cyclic chemistry of the background troposphere, where the various letters and symbols represent various atoms and molecules, which we'll learn about later in the lecture series. The whole process is initiated and propagated by energy from the sun. Components come into the cycle, are processed, and products are released. When left unperturbed, this cycle will perpetuate in such a manner. But what if we disturb this cycle? What if we were to release other gases, say from man-made processes into the air? In that case, we disrupt this balance and have the potential to produce gases and particles which are harmful to us and our environment. In combination, these initial emissions and secondary products effectively decrease the quality of our air. According to the National Geographic Society, air pollution is the existence of chemicals or particles in the air that can cause harm to the health of humans, animals and plant life. And it can even damage buildings and materials. We can divide air pollution into two distinct categories. We have gases and solid or liquid particles. And within those classes, there are many different types of chemical species. For instance, gaseous pollutants include species such as carbon monoxide, sulphur dioxide, volatile organic compounds, oxides of nitrogen, and ozone. Unlike the gaseous pollutants, owing to its complexity, at a top level, particulate matter, often simply referred to as PM for short, is most often characterised by its size rather than its chemical composition. So for instance, under the general particulate pollution category header, we have PM2.5, which is particulate matter with a diameter of 2.5 micrometres or less. We have PM10, which is particulate matter with a diameter of 10 micrometres or less. And we have total suspended particles essentially a sum of all particulate matter, despite its size. When we do categorise by composition, typical subcategories include organic particles and inorganic particles. Air pollution has a range of negative health effects on us and the environment. But perhaps the most publicised is its impact on human health. The World Health Organization estimates that air pollution is responsible for nearly half a million deaths in Europe annually, and it can shorten our life expectancy by almost a year. So where do these pollutants come from? The most significant and well-recognized source of air pollution is man and our industrial activities across the globe. We tend to categorize sources of air pollution as either mobile, such as cars and buses, which emit pollutants over a given path. They can be stationary, such as factory chimneys emitting at a point source. Or they can be area-wide, that is, a collection of interlinked smaller sources, such as a block of flats or even a whole housing estate. The majority of anthropogenic pollution sources often have one thing in common, the burning of fossil fuels. This fossil fuel burning in cars, in buses and in factories results in the production of one of the most common and problematic species of anthropogenic pollutants, that is nitrogen dioxide gas. Nitrogen dioxide, often simply referred to by its chemical symbol NO2, is a very simple molecule. It is made up of one nitrogen atom and two oxygen atoms, covalently bonded together. 
nitrogen dioxide can impose a range of both direct and indirect health effects on human beings. And it also contributes to the acidification and eutrophication of our ecosystems. Interestingly, NO2 also plays a central role in perturbing the natural cycle of tropospheric chemistry. In fact, it can propagate the formation of other pollutants, such as ozone and particulate matter, which collectively are key components of our modern day summertime smogs. DEFRA states that NO2 is one of the best indicators of air quality. Where we find a lot of NO2, we find that air quality is poor. By looking at NO2 across the Earth using measurements recorded from space, we can see quite clearly the impact of man and the huge problem we face with poor air quality. Our cities across the world stand out as striking scars in the atmosphere, with some areas far worse than others. Our home in Europe is considered a global hotspot for air pollution with large congested cities and concentrated regions of heavy industry. Similarly, levels of pollution are high in America, with East Coast cities in particular and the metropolis of Los Angeles standing out clearly. However, some of the poorest air quality of all can be found in China, where emissions from many large cities with high population densities and massive amounts of industry blight a huge area of the troposphere. Particulate matter is also released from fossil fuel burning activities. It's particularly prevalent in the exhaust emissions from diesel vehicles, like the vast majority of buzzes here in Brighton. PM can be particularly bad for human health, especially the smaller fractions, which when they're inhaled can penetrate deeply into the respiratory system and can even pass over into the bloodstream where they can have a direct impact on the major organs of the body, like the heart and the brain. According to the official AQUEG definition, airborne particulate matter is made up of a collection of solids and or liquid materials of various sizes that range from a few nanometers in diameter to around 100 micrometers. So we're going from as small as the size of a virus to about the thickness of a human hair. Particulate matter consists of both primary components, which are released directly from their source into the atmosphere, and secondary components, which are formed in the atmosphere by chemical reactions. Not all emissions that impact air quality originate from anthropogenic sources. There are many natural sources as well. For instance, between one and three billion tonnes of desert dust are uplifted into the air annually. Not only this, Three and a half million tonnes of salt flecks rise from the oceans every year. Also trees and other plants exhale billions of tonnes of organic chemicals into the air. Air pollution is a massive problem for society today. And in order to tackle this problem, we need to control and manage our air. We need targeted modelling and monitoring programmes to measure it, and research programmes to understand what those results tell us. We need legislation and mitigation strategies to reduce pollution emissions and protect ourselves and our environment. During this lecture series, we will explore all aspects of air quality management using a range of techniques, from lectures and workshops to computer-based practicals, analysing the latest data obtained from our own advanced laboratory here in Brighton. I hope you've enjoyed this introductory film. What I'd like to do now is ask you to go away, have a go at the quiz on Blackboard and have a think about any questions you might have on the topic. Thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you in class.